what's up guys this is Corey I'm gonna do something a little different today hope you enjoy it so basically we are on North Captiva so this is our favorite spot in the world it's called Beach's Edge rental house 234 B if you like the scenery feel free to look it out look it up whatever it's on VRBO we come here every year so if anybody wants to come by and see us uh, in the future, feel free to reach out. We'll hang out, drink some beer, all that good stuff. Anyways, this is all about the Jubilee history. And um, this is this will be the third time that I've tried to make this, either due to um, it not looking good and or being incorrect. So we wouldn't want to have false information out there. So I'm going to try again. I've got a bunch of notes from Roy and we'll, we'll give it a shot. So anyways, where did the Jubilee come from? Well, you have to understand that the Jubilee actually started with the K-Horn. So um, the original K-Horn was actually a, a two-way design. Okay. So when they first came out, it was two-way, but it was it was very limited driver technology back then just kind of wasn't very good um so they basically had no choice to go to a three-way design you know if you wanted a serious speaker so they did paul's long-term goal was to actually take the k-horn and return it to a two-way design they just they had they weren't able to do so around 1989 he started talking about doing this seriously like hey i think it's it's starting to be time about 1992 um there was a new generation of compression drivers and this was finally uh, a reality so um the the biggest thing was the new compression drivers that they were able to cross over lower so paul started uh, paying attention to those and um, he, he finally realized that if he could use these new compression drivers and he could take the base bin and you know make the base bin extend higher uh, then he could make this reality you got to remember that the k-horn the base bin doesn't extend all that uh, all that well so basically once it gets up to about 400 hertz it just starts falling off a cliff and he had to fix that that's where um that's where the jubilee driving point came from in 1993 um roy delgado was with klipsch and he came up with a um he came up with a prototype horn that could work with these compression drivers uh, you know basically it was what paul was looking for um, shortly after that, though, Roy actually left Clips, and um, I'm pretty sure he started working for a lawnmower company as an acoustic engineer, and I don't know the details, but um, basically he came back around 1998, and one of the first things that Paul did was actually, you know, approach him about this Jubilee project. Now, according to Roy, um, Paul was pretty elderly at this point. A lot of people think that, you know, Roy came up with the horn, Roy came up with Jubilee. Um, it was all Roy, which Roy doesn't, even if part of that is true, Roy does not like to take credit for that whatsoever. He gives all the credit to Paul. Um, according to Roy, um, Paul was getting pretty elderly at that point, and, um, he says that Paul even provided the woofer specs and um, it, it was all driven by him. So uh, you gotta remember, uh, you know, these, these base bins were basically, what do they weigh, 210 pounds a piece? And, you know, we're talking about somebody as early as Paul, you know, building prototypes, it's, it's, it's not gonna happen. So, um, and so yeah, that that's, Roy just basically says, he was Paul's muscle more than anything. And as I mentioned before, the, the, the Jubilee was actually supposed to be the, um, you know, Clipshorn part two. It, it was gonna be the Clipshorn. 
Okay, it, it wasn't gonna be the Jubilee. It was gonna, the Eclipse Horn as we know it, the original idea was that that was just gonna go away. Um, but um, from what I can tell, once Paul heard them, he just started shaking his head. And basically, you know, Roy was like, well, what's wrong? And he was like, well, we can't, this can't be the clip short. It's better than the clip short. It has to be um, something, you know, it, its own product. So um, I, w I was actually told that it went beyond that. It wasn't just going to be its own product. It was, it was actually going to be its own line. I can't prove that. I haven't read it anywhere. Somebody at some point, I think from Clips, told me the original idea was that it, there was going to be three different sizes of Jubilees. Basically, you would have a K-horn size, Daddy Jubilee, you would have Mama Jubilee, something smaller, possibly Heresy or, or Forte. Obviously, that never happened, but that was the intent. So the original horn was actually wooden. So it came from Italy and it was extremely expensive. It was like 700 bucks just for one of them. And the other problem is that um, it just took forever to make. So I think they made two of them before they decided this isn't working. You know, we're gonna have to make something out of plastic if we're gonna mass produce this thing. So basically, um, if you go to the Klipsch Museum across the road from the factory, you can still see one of those original horns. You can also see a picture of um, uh, Paul's wife standing in front of one. I, I don't know where that other one went, but the museum for sure has one. But yeah, it just didn't take long at all. And um, yeah, they were like, we can't do this. And keep in, keep in mind that the original Jubilee that they made, it was not crossed over like it is now. So basically now we've, you know, at least the current ones, I expected to go lower. The current ones are 400 or a little above. The first ones were more like 800 or so, possibly a little above it, but it was at least 800. So the, the biggest issue with that, and we'll get into this later, but the, the bass band starts beaming pretty hard at that point. So, uh, you know, it, it's ideally you would actually lower that just because of the dispersion pattern. So once we had this prototype up and going, um, you know, of course, Paul and Roy were pretty proud of that. They actually made an AES a white paper. We'll post a link to that and possibly just a couple of snippets from it. But that article was actually pretty interesting. Of, of, of course, um, you know, we, we've already talked about the frequency response being the biggest driver behind that. Just the Jubilee bass band being able to extend much higher than the clip horn. But a byproduct of that was that, I mean, it outperformed the clip horn in every way. I mean, just naming it, it did it. You know, upper extension, um, it was naturally flatter. Um, also, Distortion is is the big thing. That's the whole reason to get horns in, in the first place. And of course, when you say distortion, everybody thinks of harmonic distortion, which isn't really the whole picture. Um, the other picture is the you know the intermodulation distortion. And I think, if I remember right, um, both harmonic and intermodulation distortion was mentioned in that article. So for for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, of course, harmonic distortion is what everybody thinks of. Um, but, you know, if you play 100 hertz, you're, you're going to get a little bit of 200 hertz, for example. Um, intermodulation is a, a different story. First of all, in that it, it stands out like a sore thumb. At, at least when you're playing 200 hertz on top of 100 hertz. I mean, it takes a lot for somebody to say, hey, something isn't right. Okay, it's just a small amount of harmonic distortion um, isn't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things uh, compared to intermodulation. Now, what happens with intermodulation is, of course, forgive me, I'm from Kentucky, but uh, do you pronounce it Fourier series? 
if you look at it, I think that's how he pronounced it. Anyways, if you look at some of that stuff, basically it's the study of what happens when you know multiple waves are trying to be produced at the same time. So you know you've let's let's say you've got a 50 hertz signal and a 230 hertz signal. What's going to happen is that you've got your 50 hertz sine wave, big fat one. You've got your 230 hertz sine wave doing this. Well, when you play them together, what happens is that as your 50 is going up, you know, it, it's squiggly. You know, and if sometimes it even turns into what looks like a square wave, which which isn't good. So you can actually measure stuff that comes out of the blue that hadn't that was never in the original material so for example like i said 50 and 230 hertz you can actually play both of those at the same time what are you going to measure well if you measure like a six inch woofer which we've actually done and you crank it to high heavens um you know you're not just going to get harmonic distort you're not going to get you know harmonics of 50 what you're going to see in that situation is just absolutely weird stuff so um you're going to get frequency one plus frequency two which you know 50 plus 230 you're going to get 280 hertz you're going to get 330 hertz you're going to get frequency one or two minus one so basically you're going to get 180 hertz you're going to get 130 hertz weird stuff and it doesn't blend in so that's that's the biggest reason to go with these big fat horns just because the only way to fully get rid of it is to you know that woofer just barely needs to be tickled um and when that happens you can you know when you measure these things and look on the graph you see what you'd expect you see 50 you see 230 you don't see all this weird stuff in between which we've actually measured out out Put a post up so that that's the biggest thing that they were excited about um, that they were actually able to increase the you know decrease the distortion on top of being able to extend it so yeah if if you like the technical aspects at least um, you know try to scan that article we'll put a post up for you so after this point they wanted to actually unveil it to the world so I think it was 1999. I've heard a couple different dates. I've heard 98 and 97, but the timelines don't necessarily uh, match up. So I'm going to go with 1999 um, in CES. One of my favorite pictures of Paul was actually uh, David Wilson from Wilson Audio who's coming by to say hi to. And we'll, we'll, we'll post a picture of that up. But basically, him and his wife Cheryl came by. Super happy to see him. Uh, just super cool. Uh, you can see the the very first Jubilee in the background at that point. And, um, yeah, that was the 50th anniversary Eclipse Worm party. Um, so after that point, you know, the everything just seemed to kind of fizzle out. Um, and it, I don't know, Paula was getting pretty elderly, of course, but um, I was told a couple different stories. First story I've heard more than once uh, from more than one person. The short story is that internal politics kept the um, Jubilee from being released. So um, in Roy's own words, uh, he says, this is what really happened. And since Paul was the champion of the product, since he passed away, interest in pursuing the Jubilee waned internally. Our biggest focus at the time was home theater and with limited resources, the product went into hibernation. And I was knee deep in cinema product and commercial design. So um, I guess let's, let's back up a little bit um, before Paul died. Um, Basically, I, there was a couple different stories um, I've been told, both from Roy, actually. So the first story I heard was at CES in uh, uh, Los Angeles. So um, from my understanding, the Jubilee, he was just kind of sitting there doing nothing. Um, Roy finally went to Paul and was like, look, if you're not going to use these, let me use them in pro cinema applications. And, you know, Paul agreed and he, he got them up off the ground. 
In Roy's own words more recently, um, he says, well, kind of, since I was working on the cinema line, I knew that a 12 inch horn loaded bass bin would work in the lineup. So I asked Paul if I could introduce in cinema the KPT KHJ LF, the KPT Clipped Horn Jubilee LF. At this point, we did not know that Paul would die and would not finish putting the Jubilee into production. So one of the early um, designs right after this point that has caused a whole bunch of confusion, and I, I hope this link disappears at, at some point, but they actually made a mid-bass module. So one of the first things that you see, um, if you go to Google and you do a search, uh, I've just clips Jubilee, you can actually see this thing. So um, it, it's actually some kind of eight inch woofer sitting on that big horn. It's got an, you know, what looks like a 510 horn on top of it. And of course it says discontinued. So um, it's causing confusion because a lot of people, you know, I've, I've gotten them to be interested in the Jubilee and the first thing they do is go to Google and it says discontinued and you know, they're like, Corey, what's going on? Like, I gotta explain it all. So, um, according to Roy, this is his own words, that was strictly for the cinema side, for the output that needed, as is the case for cinema and commercial products, I added a mid-bass module so we could produce the SPL needed for the size cinema they were intended to be installed in. So somewhere around this time, um, the Paul passed away and uh, there was a really heartfelt um, uh, forum post from Roy. I'll get Jason to read it to you guys. It, it, this is on the uh, Klipsch community forum. When I got back to Klipsch, he called me into his office to talk about resurrecting his two-way Klipsch horn idea. One of the things that I was told when I came back was that Paul wanted for us to work together to make this happen. He said, Sonora, we just have to find a way to get the LF horn above 50 hertz. He said, I've seen the dirty curves on those new professional compression drivers, and using one of them, we could cross over around 800 and then return the clip horn back to a two-way. He would know when I was going to curve another proto, and if the data looked bad, I almost regretted showing him the data. He would say, got any dirty curves for me? I think we built about five or six protos that didn't work. He said, are they being built like you want into drawing? I would get discouraged, and he would say, try the effect of prayer. Honestly, I think Paul knew better than I that we would solve it. So it was with great pleasure when I took the winning set of dirty curves to him to look at. He smiled and said, show me the box. Yep, that was cool. I get very disappointed that the true flagship never made it to production for Paul's sake. Truth be told, it really never had the support it should have. Even if no one had ever seen it or heard it, I'm glad that Paul did. It truly is to me state of the art, really the best that Klipsch can do. Remember, we are horns, right? Yeah, Paul had more confidence in me than I did, and I think it took the Jube project and working for him to push me to the window to see it. Have a blessed sleep, Paul, and I'll see you someday. Roy. So, shortly after that, I'm going to say 2003. It may be 2002. There was a lot of uh, interest in the Jubilee, and... Um, it, well, I'll just, this is Roy's own words. So Trey told me that I had to get on the forum to answer people's questions about why the Jubilee was not in production since we showed it at CES. I got fed up with answering questions and promised that at a pilgrimage, I would show them what a Jubilee was. I made it as hard as possible. This, the Elohuff was our normal pro paint. I put the biggest horn I could on top, the K402. I made it active and thus required four channels of amplification. After the first demo, this guy comes up and says he wants to know how he could get a pair. That guy was Mike Beasley, AKA Mike from Tennessee on the forum. So Mike was the first um, Jubilee owner for the home. His pair is somewhat famous, just mostly because of the, what he did with the 402. Um, basically, he put these metal bars, so he, I, don't, I guess it's aluminum, uh, around the edge. It just looks really sharp. It, you can't do much to, uh, well, let's just call it putting lipstick on a pig, but you, you can't do much to those 402 horns, but he did make it look pretty sharp. 
so as we mentioned a minute ago, um, you know, the, the DSP was in place. So there was a couple, actually a few reasons that um, the DSP was used. Biggest reason is the, the base bin. I mean, it is naturally more smoother, more flat than the clips horn, but uh, it could use a little smoothing out. So, you know, they had, they basically had four um, EQ points that uh, they could play with for um, you know the base band but also um, you know the top end could look, use a little work as well this is Roy's own words on that it wasn't resonances polar problems that cause reflections back into the horn the LF horn does not have an ex expansion in the vertical plane I did some passive networks for the jubilees very complicated and could be very expensive but the passive network could not compensate for the delay so they tried to build some we'll get into that here a bit this is several years later but uh, for quite a while the only solution was basically you know you're going to use this uh, dsp period so the go-to DSP back then was the Electro Voice DX38. Um, Roy loves it. I, I think the Zillica is better myself. Uh, it's it's probably there's probably pros and cons. Um, the biggest issue back then, well, the biggest issue period in general, in my opinion, is that it's only got two inputs, four outputs. Um, it also only had four PEQ, well, it's not even really PEQs. So basically, um, the Electro Voice has four points that are DSP-like um, that you could think of as PEQs, but I'm not really sure that's what it is. Um, I think the Zillica is more granular myself. Um, just for instance, like on the crossover point, um, you know, with Electro Voice, you've got 400 or 450 hertz maybe 425 hertz but the zillica is literally you can you know if you want 413 points uh, hertz you just type it in um it's actually got six peqs um it's got several presets you can program it with a you know just a file it's just, it's just super easy um but yeah even to this day people are still using the electro voice i'm not sure it's still being made but you can easily find them on ebay just super cheap um yeah a lot of a lot of that stuff is kind of old beat up but it still works and the other thing that people ran into and has been a thorn on their sides for pretty much forever is the amplification now if you're in a large theater and you're sitting far away and there's any kind of background noise it typically not an issue if you're going to park these things in your living room from you know 12 15 feet away i mean <clears throat> keep in mind we're dealing with compression drivers that are somewhere around 108 109 db one watt one meter that's insane so <clears throat> the problem is that pretty much any amplifier that has any kind of noise floor whatsoever you are going to hear everything you're going to hear every little hiss you're going to hear every little hum so um what a lot of people used was the crown d75a again this is another situation where people are still using it still buying them to this day they're not made anymore you can buy them on ebay i mean they're 75 bucks so if you look for something cheap um that has been a proven workhorse it's only 45 watts a channel but just keep in mind you know that can that can literally give you permanent hearing damage so and in not very long of a time either and so it just having a quiet nose floor is way more important than having a ton of power on these things given the situation if you're going to park them in your living room so Fast forward around 2007, 2008, um, some people were just starting to get tired of messing with the DSP. Um, you know, of course, they had to buy it themselves. They had to, I mean, you know, research what settings to use. It wasn't people's 
favorite idea. So people started asking for for passives, and um, Roy actually made one, and he actually you know came up with a design for another. This is his own words on the subject. I designed one for the K691 slash BNC75. Uh, it's not as good as we need, as simple was a goal. I didn't like it much. <clears throat> the one for the TAD request by Marion, I had promised I would take every active element and try to incorporate it into the passive. It sounded very good, but very complicated and expensive and could not compensate for the delay needed. So the ones he mentioned for Marion, basically, I don't know, if, we'll, we'll put a picture on here. Um, if I remember right, these things, one crossover was about that big, just massive. Uh, they just basically framed it like a piece of art. Um, and uh, they're, they're hanging on the wall. I don't, you've probably never seen a crossover this massive. It, it's, it's ridiculous, yeah, gorgeous at the same time. It's just everybody loves it. Now keep in mind, there were actually multiple versions of the 402s, multiple versions of that compression driver. So basically, um, um, they had three different versions of that horn. One was a poured proprietary material. Uh, one was compression molded, one was injection molded, and um, I'll get into some of the reasons here in a little bit. Roy gave me a couple notes on it, but um, it, yeah, some of those designs, you know, they were they were made for a different compression driver. They were made for a different horn. So um, I th I'm I, I don't want to say any names, but a certain crossover company that I believe started with a C um, started making some of these but you know it it was um, it was for a different design I think he kind of modified it started making his own using his own compression driver but that was kind of his own thing that did not come from Roy uh, or Klipsch so one of the first well the first compression driver that he used was the K69 the manufacturer of that was P Audio, I believe. Um, well, that actually came from here in Paducah, or, or through Paducah, that is. So there was actually a company um, called Acoustic Design, headed up by Bart Young. Um, he got his start, as far as I can tell, over at Credence, which is it, just down the road from Old House, uh, basically Credence made a bunch of car audio. They made Kicker, Lanzar, Boswick, um, I've seen JL stuff in there. But they also made uh, Woofers, um, Celestion, they made compression drivers, made all kinds of good fun stuff. Uh, early 2000s, they actually shut down and um, there was a lot of the car audio companies, actually everybody, started jumping ship going to China um, to get all their goodies. So they ended up closing down. Um, I think a few manufacturers left them high and dry, but um, Bart ended up it's at some point starting his own thing over in Paducah. And yeah, he's just down the road from my showroom. So he was actually the importer or I guess the American agent for P Audio. So the K69s actually came through him. And which is kind of neat to me just because, well, Paducah isn't the only, you know, there's that, but there's also, Paducah is a huge audio town. I don't, I don't, most people don't realize that. I happen to be proud of it. But, um, you know, close to our place was also the old uh, Chicago uh, telephone spot, CTS. And back in the late 60s, early 70s, they actually made Cornwall and Cape Horn buffers. The old K33P actually came from Paducah. So, you know, the compression driver from Jubilees came from Paducah. So I just, I always thought it was neat, personally. Um, yeah, huge, huge audio town. We've got, um, oh, Gary Draffin lives half a mile from me. He actually got started start at CTS. I mean, he, uh, um, you know, he started one of the big um, one million square foot facilities over in China. They make PSB um, and other uh, manufacturers that I won't get into. But uh, uh, yeah, just just super cool history on audio in, in Paducah. I'm just proud, of, super proud to be a part of it. Back to the different versions of the stuff. Everything stayed pretty normal until around 2009 or so. Um, 
you know, they they switch to injection molding on, on the horn, but they also tweaked the bass band a little bit. There was some feedback from, there wasn't any major changes as far as I'm aware on the, on the bass band, but there was some feedback from the plant workers. Um, certain things were hard to make and I think they complained and they re-engineered some stuff to make it much easier on them. Uh, at the same time, they also changed the 402 horn to injection molded. So this is Roy's own words on that. So we went to injection molding because now we could justify the cost of tooling because of how many 402s we were selling. And of course, because of injection molding, the price of the horn went down. We were already using the BNC in a two-way cinema system. Because the diaphragm is larger on the BNC versus the K69, we used the BNC on two-way cinema systems to keep the distortion down. For the home, the, K the 69 would never generate the SPLs that were required in a cinema, and I thought it would be good. It thought it would not matter. At some point, because of MOQs, the cost of the BNC came down, and I wanted to go one driver for all cinema. So we actually have, um, the two original prototypes from that time frame, from, from 2009, the very first base band and the very first injection molded horns we actually have at the warehouse. Um, Roy had them for a while, then uh, they ended up um, lost in storage eclipse. So anyways, we had them and yeah, I had them in my personal theater room for quite a while. So just fun history on those. Uh, after that point, there were a few updates, but nothing really significant. So basically, um, the pro cinema guys use these more than anything, and you know they they had the terminal strips switched around a little bit. So the original, for quite a while, the terminal strips were actually on the front, um, actually underneath the 402 horn. It was kind of awkward. Then they got changed over to the side, but it was still on the top. Um, and then eventually they got changed it, to, I think it was Trent Zahal that complained because his kid was trying to yank on him. We ended up getting the, um, the, the terminal strip actually moved to the actual side of it and plus around to the back. It's just uh, more friendly for home users. So I don't think there was any negative aspect for the theater guys. I think they liked it up top, but I'm not entirely sure. Also, the only other slight change I can think of is that the woofer manufacturers changed. So basically, um, at some point, it wasn't that long ago, um, maybe three or four years, uh, if I remember right. But basically, whoever was making the uh, woofers just ab abruptly started and stopped. So there was somewhat of a rush to try to find a new manufacturer, which they did pretty quick. Uh, it's the same specs. I don't think anybody can tell them apart whatsoever. So during this whole time, people didn't stop making um, at attempts to try to make that 402 horn look prettier and actually the whole thing to look prettier. Uh, like I said before, it, it's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. I, I think that it's a utilitarian design. I mean, to me, it's kind of like buying a Jeep and trying to make it look like a Lambo. Uh, it's just, uh, why not I just embrace the utilitarianism of it? But that's just me. Um, Lots of people, you know, of course, Michael Beasley, the first residential owner, you know, he put that aluminum bar, which looked really good. There was a guy in Canada um, who made that beauty panel on the front uh, really popular. He had even got a, uh, um, a matching 1802 beauty panel on the front. So everybody loves that picture. I think he actually covered up the 402 somehow. Probably the most famous one that's uh, trying, you know, in terms of trying to pretty things up is that there was a, actually a factory made pair from Travis Williamson. Pretty sure it's over at Luther Ward's house. I may have that backwards, but I don't think so. Basically, um, he had some kind of exotic veneer, you know, which was super pretty in the first place. But the interesting thing about these is the whole thing is veneered. So all those little horn mouths on the side, all that's veneer and of course it took clips forever um, and it, after they were done they basically said never again so you got to remember clips isn't really a veneer company 
a lot of people think that oh they'll just make jubilees and they'll slap some veneer on the front and it doesn't really work that way so the the beauty panel the beauty panel on the front is actually the front the same panel that's on the front end of the cable and they just machine it out okay so um clips tries to avoid actual veneer where they like the plague so all that stuff actually comes in from a company called formwood and you know so like when you order walnut you don't get mdf and then walnut strips you get mdf that's already glued to walnut so it's just much easier on clips uh, the biggest thing is that um, the end result is just much more uniform and it's just a lot less labor intensive so the beauty panel doesn't work like everybody thinks it does is my point so on this next point i guess i gotta choose my words carefully um there's been a lot of people over the years who have tried to um modify not really modify but have tried to get a better compression driver so the it the, the k691 that comes with it is, is a nice driver however um <clears throat> a lot of people have tried to uh, get uh, beryllium drivers over the year uh, the biggest uh, the most popular one was the tad um, but people have also tried to use radian um, you know bama actually was working on one that sounded promising but i'm not sure it ever came to market they, they make some that have a nice coating on the dome which you know keeps ringing down keeps your whole ear fatigue from uh, annoying you too much but uh, you know there's also the radian driver from the crossover company um, just lots of people have tried different ones of, of, of course at that point you got to come up with your own settings i don't know that the settings that we pre-program everything is, is going to work properly I'm, I'm sure it works for the most part but you know you pretty much got to um um you know come up with your own settings based on measurements at that point so roy's own words on the whole tad situation was this the tad was not a factory option i was able to get some tads from for some of the boneheads because of one of my friends mike thompson in the cinema space actually the 1133 was developed for the kpt 535 and it was then that i moved out the mid base module and moved in the mid and hf horns of the 535 for the kpt jubilee system it is not the weak link so at this point you know everything's been pretty stable it's it's been you know um the the state that it was in around 2015 hasn't really changed much in terms of the product itself however about that time myself Paducah home theater um started selling them to residential people and um this isn't a, you know we've been super proud of this or at least i have just because not everybody can can order this um it, i'm pretty sure that the jubilee uh, plus a couple other products is one basically um roy signs off on every single purchase so your average dealer can't just um call up clips and and get jubilees it, it doesn't doesn't you know and, and ship them to people it, it doesn't really work that way the new ones maybe i don't know if they're going to have training or what but historically speaking at least until right now you know springtime 2021 um your average dealer can't even can't get the things so we've been super proud that we've for quite a while uh, we've mostly been the sole provider of these things um you know for for years the pro cinema guys were were selling them but you know once once um we started selling so many in, re in the residential space i'm pretty sure that got cut off i don't know the exact i don't keep up with all that but I, I'm pretty sure that got nipped in the bud. So we've been mostly selling them for quite a while. So one of the things that we noticed right off the bat, um, it didn't take long at all, was that people were complaining about the whole crossover situation. So keep in mind, it, they didn't, the electric voice wasn't made anymore. So we basically had to get people 
to go to eBay and, um, you know, get a used electric voice and bring it back. We had to get them the um, um, settings and they had to punch it in themselves. They, they just, they didn't like that at all. And so, I mean, some people were cool with it. There was, a, you know, the Jubilees tend to attract, um, you know, the technical guys, which those guys didn't really ma mind, but we were, we were selling quite a few and a lot of people were super intimidated about this. So I got the wild idea. Well, why can't we just pre-program these things? So um, one of the, one of the crossovers that had been popular in the Eclipse community was actually the Zillica units, like the, the, you know, the 4080s and whatnot. So um, I like these units. Roy tends to like the um, Electro Voice, but the, the Zillica has multiple advantages. Uh, to me, it's, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, it's, it's, it's more granular. It's, it's got more PEQs. Um, it's got more settings, got more inputs, got more outputs. Like what can it not do better? But one of the biggest things I like about it, it as it pertains to this conversation is that basically um, you can pre-program it super easily. Like it, all it takes is a file. So we actually sent one to Roy, which by the way, um, you know, you can't, you can't just intermingle, interchange uh, crossover settings. And we found that out real quick. Basically, if you take the Zillica and you feed it, uh, the settings that are good for the electric voice, it's just junk. Like, so the biggest problem, the PEQs work out pretty well. And the biggest problem is the, um, um, at the low shelf filter that we mentioned earlier. So basically, if you were to take a normal 402 horn with a normal K691 and, you know, just run a sweep on it, it's going to start falling, you know, it, by the time it gets to 10 kilohertz, it's just, I mean, it, it's in a free fall. Um, so that low shelf filter actually brings it up and, and makes it flat. The problem is that if you take that, the settings of the Electro Voice and you just blindly plug it into the Exilica, it, it doesn't work right at all. Like it, it almost like, it almost works in the opposite way that, that you'd expect. So it's, it's just not correct. So we actually had to send the XP, you know, um, 4080 into Roy. He put it in the chamber and he came up with the correct solutions. That was cool because at that point, you know, I, I was looking at Legacy at that point. So I think you pronounce it the Aris, A-E-R-I-S. At least used to, they used to use the same exact Zillica DSP that we did. And um, so that's where, uh, Legacy is where I got that idea from. Anyways, at that point, we could take Roy's settings, we could save it to a file. And when people ordered Jubilees, we could cross sell them a DSP, which was, cool in general, but we could also pre-program the thing. So, and we didn't have to spend, you know, 20 minutes punching in all this stuff. All we had to do is turn it on, open a file, save it, boom, done. So we could pre-program all three LCR. You could have Jubilee LCRs and not have to turn, touch a thing, just turn it on and it just works. We never had that at that, you know, before that point. So we were super excited about that. So anyways, now we've got the, you know, fine tune solution from Klipsch. We've got pre-programmed DSPs. I can ship the things out and, you know, people can get them working within, you know, five minutes of opening the box. It, it's just, that kind of exploded the popularity at, at that point when we, we just started, we've been ordering batches of, you know, eight at a time. We've ordered several batches like that. And, you know, we've just never, we've never seen um, clip horns sell like that just whatsoever. And so we're, we're expecting the new ones to be you know, just really popular. Uh, there's a lot of momentum at this point. Um, but like I said, the current ones are technically, they're discontinued at this point. Um, I, I bought as many as I could. There was, you know, a few parts left over. And, uh, you know, so this last, last batch was the last one I was able to order. Um, 
but looking back I mean what what did the Jubilee product accomplish I mean what why would you want the okay first of all you know low distortion um, flatter response um, lower on D distortion as well as uh, you know harmonic um, but the, the biggest thing that people are shocked about is the sound stage of these things. And, and it's all because of that 402 horn. And I, I, I expect the new ones to be even better, but um, the sound stage is just ridiculous. And especially for home theater. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're listening, if you're audiophile sitting at home and you have everything set up and you're, you know, magic seat, you know, whatever, but as soon as everything's good but as soon as you sit on the other side of the couch what happens i mean so many speakers you just the sound stage just gets destroyed um, so basically you move to the other side of the room or the couch um <clears throat> all the sounds coming from that speaker on that side of the room well, with a jubilee it's just it's not like that and you know, it's hard to describe but um, multiple people has basically said the sound stage is the size of their couch. I mean, you can't say that with most speakers. Um, you know, if you're sitting way off axis um, and still be able to hear uh, the speaker on the other side of the room just fine, still be able to, you know, image it in the middle of the screen. I mean, that that's pretty huge. So that seems to be the, the biggest um, thing that people enjoy about them you know of course the distortions cool the kick drums in your chest is cool but yeah just the imaging is just second to none i've, I've never seen anything like it <clears throat> so that's about it for the history um now you know if i would i would speak a little longer if this was uh, a year from now and the new ones are coming out. So uh, just as a short um, recap of what I know about that, I can't spill everything, but Clips has uploaded some some YouTube material. Uh, they've leaked some renderings. So I'm just gonna go based on what I've seen on that that any average Joe could figure out. So the, the first thing that you notice is that it looks pretty wide. The second thing you notice is that there is an aerial shot of the um, bass band and if, if you notice you see one um, basket and magnet assembly but you also see a cluster of ports which is is pretty telling because that's uh, Roy's signature uh, subwoofer technology. So look at the interior of a KPT like uh, 1802 um those things the way that they work in layman's terms is that you take a single driver um you port it you take a horn you wrap around the whole thing and you know the the 1802 was like that uh, the 1502 was like that um they were tuned a little higher but you can actually tune them lower than what they were Best I can tell, this new Jubilee uses that same technology. Uh, the interesting thing about those is that nobody's really done it before, so there's you can't just open up a book and say, hey, what's my formulas for this? And so basically what you have to do is build a prototype and then start shoving the thing full of two befores and, and a bunch of weird stuff. Um, it, it, it's a lot of trial and error, things like that. Um, so yeah, at this point I fully expect um, them to use that. I fully, I, I believe it's going to uh, extend quite a bit lower. This stupid bot line. Um, Roy's even went on um, um, the forum. We've talked about the low extension. He claims that it's flat to like 17, 18 hertz, which is going to be absolutely insane. Another thing that you'll notice about the renderings is that um, there appears to be a small box that says Jubilees on it. And they haven't said one way or another how this product will be, but based on that box, I, you've got to deduct that there's going to be a DSP. I don't, I don't know where else that box would be. Um, also, you can tell that they've, they've prettied it up. Uh, basically, the I forget his name. Um, there's an industrial designer that works for Clips. She's top notch. She did a real good job. Roy was super happy about it. Uh, basically, they um, 
um, well, they um, they put grill cloth over the horn mouse. Uh, they, I'm pretty sure that 402 horn. Um, I forget if it's got grill cloth or not. I'm not sure it's on some of the renderings. There is it, like a wooden panel that goes around the 402 horn. Um, also, it looks just super wide. Um, I, I can't remember seeing any terminal cups. I'd, I'd have to bring up the renderings again, but um, yeah, it, it should be like the current ones on steroids. Um, I halfway expect the crossover point to be lowered a little bit. I, I expect the uh, low extension to be quite a bit lower. So you got to remember now, it's, um, you know, the, the current Jubilees just kind of fall off a cliff at 38 hertz. We put in a boost, probably about a 5 dB boost at uh, 33 hertz uh, just to bring it up. We can get most everything in the 30 something region on up like that. Um, the new ones with the new ported horn, whatever you call it, technology from the 1802. Yeah, it's just, it's going to be able to extend quite a bit lower. I mean, it's, the two channel guys for sure are going to be super happy. Uh, you should not have to run a subwoofer with it at all. Um, it's just going to be like a two miniature 1802s. I just, I can't imagine how hard it's going to hit. I, I've, the, just the current ones, I, I've had loud enough that it, your breathing kind of feels funny. It just kind of resonates in your chest. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. So anyways, um, that's literally all I can think of. And according to my screen, I've been talking for, uh, before editing, this is going up on 55 minutes at this point. So that's, I, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> so just apologize in advance, but I just, Nobody else knows some of this stuff. I just wanted to get out there. So I will say I'm super excited about the new ones coming out. Um, you know, like I said, we've been, um, you know, we've been so, the sole supplier of the uh, residential ones, at least for the most part, for, you know, quite a while at this point. So I hope you guys don't disappear and go elsewhere. When the new ones come out, feel free to call me up, um, send us a message. We're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, go to our site and, you know, these should be available to purchase on the site. Um, we fully plan on have them in stock, but at the minimum, like these are, these aren't really a, um, you know, something that just anybody can, you know, set up. I mean, there's there's still going to be some quirks. I mean, for example, just one off the top of my head, that the back wall is going to be a uh, recurring issue. It's always been a recurring issue. So basically, if you were to Google SBR uh, interactions, you will see like, you know, for example, if you take a subwoofer and um, you want punchy bass, you know, one of the fastest ways of killing it is to take the thing and move it four foot, five foot out in the room. So what happens is that um, your bass isn't just coming off the cone, your, your bass is actually coming off the cone, traveling backwards, bouncing off the wall, coming forwards, and partially canceling when an owl was coming off the cone. Well, with the Jubilees, like, you get the same mess on that back wall. So if you really get into this stuff, and you, you know, you're sitting four foot off that, or so off that back wall, a lot of times you can have a big notch in your um, frequency response, more so than normal speakers. And, you know, some people would struggle with that. Still a lot of little quirks, and, you know, with the DSP and amplifier choices, I, it's still gonna be a, a, a more technical product than usual. Um, you know, we've been doing this for years at this point, and um, there's only, two, three other, other dealers in the residential space who has um, sold any at all. So we've got a huge head start. I would love to help you out and love to help you design stuff. Um, but even if you do go elsewhere, feel free to reach out and we'll repost all your pictures if you wish. So anyways, well, I guess I'm signing off. And once again, this is, if you like the view, of this, I just happen to be on vacation. This is called Beach's Edge in North Captiva, Unit 234B. Um, I'll just get the camera right here. So basically we like this just because of the panoramic view. I mean, the, 
there's plenty of uh, oceanfront spots, but this was actually grandfathered in. So there is a more than 180 degree view of the Gulf. It just goes forever. And so the reason I say it's grandfathered in is that this house is actually, you see all these other houses. I mean, they're beachfront, but they're nowhere near the, um, nowhere near as close to the beach as, as this place is. So um, basically this was built probably in the seventies, just, guessing i don't really know but yeah we love it here and uh anyways um yeah come we come here every year feel free to come by and visit sometime so anyways this is Corey signing off talk to you later bye